so this is the last chapter that we're going to cover in uh, the Physics 272 course this term. It's chapter 14 of your text on geothermal energy. There is a PowerPoint on D2L that introduces the topic and gives you some nice pictures. Uh, the basic story is that the inner core of the Earth is extremely hot, 4,000 degrees Celsius, and heat is continuously flowing from that core up to the surface. That heat is maintained by radioactive decay of uranium, thorium, and potassium that has been in the Earth since its creation. Um, the average heat flow at the surface is small, about 60 milliwatts per square meter, but if you multiply by the surface area of the Earth, it's huge. So there's 30 terawatts of heat um, reaching the surface overall. Remember, we only are using 19 terawatts, but it's not very useful because the temperature gradient is on average quite small. The average temperature gradient is 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, which is not useful for extracting power or um, doing anything with really. So you need to be at a hot spot if you're going to extract geothermal energy. That usually occurs at tectonic plate boundaries of which BC sits. Um, it's called the ring, ring of fire. Um, however, it is also a dangerous place to put geothermal plants because of the risk of earthquakes. But there's still many, many places around the world that are generating power from the temperature gradient as you go down in the earth. Um, it's very reliable. It doesn't turn on and off like the wind and the sun. It's well established. And um, we're going to look at two methods of heat extraction. So basically what you do is you drill down um, until you're at a really high temperature and then you pump water down there you let the water get hot and you bring the hot water up which then you extract its heat to generate steam to turn turbines to generate electricity um, there's two things you can have dry rock which sometimes they have to frack to open up the spaces within the rock so that they so when you pump the water down the water has somewhere to go or if you're in an area where you already have hot water just sitting down there below the surface you simply have to drill down to release that hot water okay so i'll do just the basic um, equations that you need here oh my gosh i don't know how to keep changing this okay so we're going to do let's do the dry rock method first so we're going to consider a well that goes down into the ground and the area over which we're pumping the water down will be A. This will be the surface. And surface temperature will be T0. And the depth Z will be 0 here. Now Z, it's one of those unusual situations where Z is going to increase going down. Okay, because we're always going down. Okay, now you you get to a point where it's called the minimum useful temperature. And you have to go at least that deep or it's just useless. So this is going to be depth Z1 and it's going to be temperature T1. And this is called the minimum useful temperature that occurs at a depth Z1. And then down here is going to be Z2, that's as deep as you can go, and that's T2. Now, now there are wells that are tremendously deep. They've actually, in Russia, they've drilled down 13 kilometers, but in general, it's definitely not that, that deep. Okay, so T2 is going to be temperature at max depth. Okay, so what we want to do is figure out how much heat is in this rock. And if we pull the heat out, um, at what rate is it going to cool off? And how long can we pull the heat out? So I'm not going to go through the whole huge derivation. You can look in your textbook. It's all in your textbook. But basically what you do to figure this out, remember the temperature is increasing as you go down. So there's what's called the temperature gradient. And remember a gradient is a ch change with distance as opposed to a rate, which is a change with time. 
So temperature gradient they call G, and that's going to be dt dz. And we'll assume it's constant over this region between z1 and z2. Now, if it's constant, we can, it's just a straight line, we can write that the change in temperature is equal to g times the change in depth. And that's just a straight line equation where g is the slope. It means that we can take any two temperatures, like useful, minimum useful temperature minus surface temperature, would be g times depth z1 minus 0, because the surface, obviously, z is 0. Or we can take t2 minus t1, and that would be the gradient times z2 minus z1. So those relationships are often quite handy when we're doing this derivation. And so the way that you would calculate this amount of heat is you'd, it, it's an integral. We're not going to do the integral. You can look in the book for the integral. But you would divide this into little strips of thickness dz. And this little strip would have energy dE, a little bit of energy. And the... And this would all be at time zero, so the zero refers to time zero. Because obviously as soon as you start extracting heat, these temperatures are going to decline. So at time zero, the total amount of heat available in that rock between the depths of Z1 and Z2 would be the sum of all the strips DE. And like I say, I'm just going to give you the result here. So it depends on the density of the rock, rho r. It depends on the area. Um, over which you're pumping out the water. Depends on specific heat capacity of the rock. Depends on that temperature gradient. Depends on the depths. And it actually turns out as squared because when you put that gradient in there and integrate, you get a square. And there's the equation. Okay, so what are all these things? We better mark them down. Rho R is density of rock. Um, usually we use granite for an example. I think it's about 820 or sorry, that's um, 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter. So this density of rock, kilograms per cubic meter, A's area. And now it's gonna, it's never meter squared, it's always kilometer squared, it's huge areas that they pump this water down over. But to get all the units to work, that's gotta be in meters squared. CR is specific heat capacity. You want these numbers to be high. You want this to be a high specific heat capacity because it means the rock holds lots of heat. And that's in joules per kilogram degree Celsius. G I've defined the temperature gradient, and G would be in G would be in uh, degree C per meter. Temperature change per meter, that's a G. Uh, and then Z1 and Z2 are the depths in meters. Did I put that up here already? Yeah, okay, well, I can, we can put the list down here if you want again. So Z1 and Z2 are, oops, are depths in meters. Okay, and so this E naught, E naught is called the youthful energy between Z1 and Z2. Okay, so that's the first equation. Um, now, we define another quantity, theta. Now, believe it or not, theta is in climate modeling, theta is often used as the variable for temperature. So it is not an angle here. So we're going to define theta as equal to T2 minus T1 over 2. And this is called the average available temperature. And what it is, it's the average temperature above the minimum useful temperature. So this is average temp above minimum useful temperature. So in other words, 
if let's say we were going down and we've got this is 100 degrees C and then down here we have 200 degrees C here's the surface whatever it may be doesn't matter um, average available temperature would be 150 so theta here would be 150 okay now it turns out that that temperature is the thing that we express the um, the rate of heat loss is going to be um, dependent on this quantity so as we extract the heat that average available temperature declines exponentially and so the expression once again the derivation of this is in your book if you want to look at that so this is the um, this is the average available temperature at time t this is the initial value at t equals zero so this is before you start pumping out the heat t here is time in well i can put it in anything you like seconds years it's whatever the tau is in now tau once again we've seen this lots of times tau is called the time constant right in a time of one time constant that average available temperature will have dropped to one over e its initial value so this is called the time constant and if t is going to be in seconds this would also have to be in seconds because you don't need you don't want any units up there in that exponent now the time constant so time constant, so this is the time constant for cooling the rock and so it depends on the properties of the rock if you've got a rock with high specific heat capacity and high density then it's going to take a long time to cool so this tau uh, is defined to be density of rock times the area specific heat capacity capacity of rock it depends what the two depths are now it also depends on how fast you're pumping the water down and pulling it out if you're pumping water down at a super high rate that's going to cool off more quickly and so now we introduce this new variable v dot and we introduce the specific heat capacity and density of the water that you're using to extract the heat so v dot is the rate of water flow to remove heat and this would be in so it's a volume flow rate so this is volume per second so it's in meters cubed per second okay that's the rate at which you're pumping water down um, rho w that's density of water so that's a thousand of water because that's what they use to pump down this water does tend to get uh, full of an awful lot of nasty minerals down there but CW is the 4186 specific heat capacity of water joule per kilogram degree C and that's specific heat capacity of water Okay, so that now also not only is the temperature decreasing, the amount of energy available energy is also decreasing, and it follows the exact same relationship, and it's got the same time constant. So that is the same time constant as for the temperature, um, and this is the initial available energy. at t equals zero and then this will tell you how much available energy you have later so this is energy at sine t okay now the rate of heat extraction is just the derivative of this the so rate of heat extraction is dE dt which would be E0 
negative e0, right, over tau e to the minus t over tau. Okay, so it's just a derivative. And that would be in joules per second. Okay, so this is in joules per second. Now, this is assuming that when you take the heat out, nothing is replenishing it. But of course, there is something replenishing it because there's lots of hot rock all around the area. So when you work out the time constant, you're going to find that it's smaller than it is in real life because you've got this, it's not just all energy out, there's a bit of energy going in as well. Okay, so that takes care of the equations we need to do an example, which will be in the next video.